Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see uh, you this morning. I was telling the boys, I said, you never know how early snow is going to come in South Dakota. I said, I remember uh, three Halloweens that we trick-or-treated, or the kids trick-or-treated in the snow. They said, that's not possible. Because in New Jersey, you get snow maybe January, maybe February. Robert's all excited. I have a, a John Deere snowblower that I bought from a, from a friend, another pastor, and we're itching it to, uh, uh, to try it out. So we're going to turn him loose uh, this afternoon. But it's good that uh, we can come together and worship. Uh, welcome to those who are uh, joining us on uh, Facebook Live. You too are part of the family as we gather uh, this morning. One quick announcement you probably heard through the phone tree that we have postponed uh, the Reformation rally that was set uh, for this evening. Uh, probably two weeks from now, two Sundays from now, uh, we will once again come together as a community of churches uh, to celebrate uh, the Reformation and to focus on uh, God's renewal uh, of his church through his word. So we want to look forward uh, to that. Uh, just to add to our prayer request, uh, Bernie Buchelman uh, remains at uh, Parkston Hospital. We'll be in prayer for him and for others who are uh, homebound, who are struggling either with the virus or the after effects of the virus, who have a myriad of other health concerns. We ask that God to be with them and to bless them. But we are here this morning uh, to worship the Lord, and I invite you to join me uh, in this call to worship. God, we know you are with us. You have showered your love upon us since the beginning. Guide us now through this time and into the week ahead. Father, these are the words of Moses man of God in Psalm 90. And in that psalm, he reminds us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. May we number these moments as we gather as your people, in your house, around your word, wherever we may be. And may your spirit fall afresh on us that we might worship you today and always in spirit and in truth, we ask this, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. I invite you to, to join as we stand and sing together, God of the Ages. <laughs>
amazing grace, his powerful peace be yours today. Gifts from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus.
us join our hearts and voices together in this prayer of confession. Almighty and loving God, you created us to love you, worship you, and serve you. But our brokenness and sinfulness tarnishes the beauty and perfection of your creation. We are hard-hearted and indifferent toward your kingdom. We easily forget your call to love you with all of our heart, soul, and might. Forgive us for being preoccupied with ourselves and not fulfilling our call to fully surrender and serve you. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in us. Hear these words of assurance. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let's respond to the mercy of the Lord as we sing together. Lord, to, to be stopping. There doesn't seem to be any change 
in the forecast see dire. We wonder why. We look around at what is going on still in our streets and we see the riots and the violence. We see the, the partisanship. And we say, how can anyone govern a land so divided as ours? Forgive us, Father, when the focus is upon ourselves. When we look at what we can do on how we can set the course, how we can judge and rule, how we can make our lives do what we want it to do. Mother, we can't do that. That is an illusion that we have any control. We may try and we may do those things that keep us healthy. We may strive and we may work, we may take, break our back against the grindstone thinking that, that we can take a life for ourselves. The Father, all of that is a lie. Because our time is in your hands. Father, we need times like this to be reminded. Moments like this when we can repent of our self-reliance on our arrogance to say that we can do anything outside of your will. We need to be reminded in this one day in seven that you are the creator and we are the creation. That you are God and we are not. That we need to step down from the throne so that you might reign in our lives. That you might lead us into all of our tomorrows. Father, help us to trust. To put our lives in your hands and say, Lord, wherever you lead, we will follow. Whether you take us to the mountains or to the depths of the valley, we will believe that you are the good shepherd, that you are leading us to pastures green to water still, that we are marching to Zion, and that in spite of the twists and the turns, the ups and the downs, the stops and the starts, the detours and the delays, you will bring us at just the right time to your heavenly kingdom. And that the journey can be one of joy and not sorrow. Lord, lead us on. Lead your church to gospel faith. May we live our lives in such a way that others will want to know why we are different why we can smile in the rain, why we are not broken by sorrow, that even in days that are drear, we have hope because we trust in you. May we be a living testimony to lives surrendered to your love, to your grace, and to your mercy knowing that you do all things, and you do all things well. Father, we pray for those who are in the midst of the struggle today, those who are laid aside by sickness, those who are wearied by the world, those who are weighed down by burdens that they cannot even express to those closest. You have promised never to leave us nor forsake us. You have said, cast your burdens upon me because I care for you. Father, sometimes that's hard to do, to just let go and to let you work. But Father, we pray for those who are holding on too tightly to release the grip and to fall into your grave. Father, heal the sick. Comfort the sorrowing. Lift up those who are weighed down. Encourage us all to give you our all. Because you have given us all in Jesus Christ. For he is the one who shows the depth of your love. May we never doubt, but in those moments when 
fear and anxiety creep in, may we lift our eyes to the cross and be reminded of the one who died for us, that we might not only live eternally, but each day live abundantly. To you we offer our lives in surrender, our time, our talent, and our treasure. And now we seek your grace upon your people, upon your church here and throughout the world, as we lift up again the prayer that Jesus taught, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to hear from God's word this morning, let us ask that God would open our eyes, our ears, and our lives. Follow the chain. Uh, if you follow the chain, there would 
be some kind of reward uh, at the end. Well, those things haven't changed in the internet age. In fact, I was just reading about a chain letter that went out to a number of uh, consistories. And this is what the, the chain letter said. It said, this chain letter is meant to bring you happiness. Simply sit down and make a list of five other churches that are tired of their ministers. Send a copy of this letter to all five churches on the list. Then send your pastor to the church on the bottom of the list. In one week, you will receive 15,625 ministers. One of them should work for you. P.S. Don't break the chain. One church did and got their own ministers. <laughs> Someone came up to me uh, after the service on Sunday. And said, you know, Pastor, you have set the bar really, really high for yourself. And I laughed and said, wait till I tell what I expect of you guys next week. The title of today's sermon is How to Have a Better Pastor. Everybody wants a good pastor. Everybody wants a, a, a good minister. You don't call a pastor the expectation that he's going to be a judge. You don't go through the search process only to say, well, you know what, it's been two weeks, we're not happy, you know, let's ship him off to the next church at the bottom of the list. Churches begin with an anticipation that this is going to be a, a great relationship. And it begins that way, but unfortunately, along the way, sometimes things go a little askew. I graduated, like I said, uh, almost 30 years ago from seminary. And a while back, I was thinking about my fellow pastors, those who graduated with me, those who were friends of mine. We all entered the ministry together with great anticipation. And we talked about our, our first churches and, and the hope that we had of long and blessed ministry. But when I started to do the tally, I was shocked. Because more than half of the individuals that I began ministry with are out of ministry. And another maybe 15% of those are no longer doing parish ministry. They're no longer preaching and teaching in church on a regular basis. They found other jobs with ministry organizations. Now some of those were out of the ministry because of moral failure. But a lot of them were out of the ministry because of the expectations of their congregation and their inability to persevere in the ministry. I've been 30 years nearly in the ministry because of the people of God. I said last week that when I came here, when I was installed, one of the ministers said, the minister that Scott will become is dependent upon you, his congregation. You will shape who your pastor becomes. And that's true. The people really shape the minister. Yes, the minister teaches and preaches, and it's his desire to help God change his people. But the rising and falling of a minister is as much dependent upon the congregation as it is the one who occupies the pulpit. And so I want to share with you some things I've learned over these past nearly 30 years on how a church can have a better pastor. How a church can have a pastor that they can depend upon. A pastor that, that they can, can trust. A pastor that will lead them to green pastures and water still. A, a shepherd who will lead them through the valley of shadows, who will be with them for the long haul. So as last week I gave you the acrostic pastor, this week, I want to give you the acrostic people. How can you 
have a better pastor. Whether it is myself or other pastors that you come in contact with, those who are visiting with us today, those who are listening uh, via Facebook Live, how you can have a better pastor in your own congregation. Let me share with you first. The first thing that the people need to do is they need to pray for us. Prayer is the chief desire of everyone who stands in the pulpit. Everyone who shepherds the people of God desires prayer. At the conclusion of Hebrews in our text, in that first part of verse 18, as the writer of Hebrews is talking about the responsibility of, of ministers who have to give an account for God's people. How can ministry be enjoyed on earth? He says quite simply, pray for us. The Apostle Paul, probably uh, the minister par excellence, the one that we look to for, for guidance on how to be shepherds of God's people, eight different times, eight times in his letters, he specifically asks for prayer. I've included those verses uh, for you. But they're almost all the same thing. Paul says, pray for us. Pray for us. Pray for us. Pray that the ministry would be successful. Pray that we can withstand temptation. Pray for our ability to uh, stand up against the world for Jesus Christ. Prayer is the best gift that you can give a minister. Prayer is the best way that you can ensure that your pastor becomes a better pastor. I mentioned before Charles Spurgeon. He's known as the Prince of Preachers. Every Sunday, he preached to thousands and thousands, 6,000 people at multiple services. Millions of people throughout his ministry. Even now, his word written on paper has the ability to change. And at the height of his popularity, he preached in front of 25,000 at the Crystal Palace in London. And people started coming to him and they, they said, you know, Pastor Spurgeon, how can you preach with such power? How can you preach to, to all of these thousands and thousands of people and have the impact that you do? And Spurgeon said, come with me. And he left the, uh, the entryway there at the Metropolitan Tabernacle Church in London, and he took them down winding stairs to the very basement of the church, right next to the furnace room. And he opened up the door, and there were dozens and dozens of people on their knees. And Spurgeon says, you see this? This is the powerhouse of my preaching. This is the power of this church. And every Sunday, for every service, there would be dozens of people down in the basement praying for the success of the preaching work. Spurgeon says, you want to know where my power in preaching comes from? It comes from the prayers of my people. So you want better preaching? You want better teaching? You want a better pastor? Pray. Closely tied to this is the, the second point I want to make. The second thing that the church needs to do to have a better pastor is to encourage us. To encourage us. I was packing up my office in preparation uh, for the move. And I'm cleaning out my, my desk. And I open up one of the desk drawers, and there is a baggie, one of those gallon Ziploc baggies. And in that baggie were dozens and dozens of cards and letters and notes that I had received over the, the 24 years that I was pastor in New Jersey. Some of them were from members of the congregation. Some of them were from families where I had done funerals for uh, their loved ones. Some of them were from people who had gotten copies of my sermon because someone had given them. 
But the reason I kept them wasn't so that I could puff myself up, wasn't to say, oh, you know, you know how great am I, all these people, you know, are thinking of me. I kept these specific notes and cards because in those notes and cards, they were thanking me for doing ministry with them. There was an individual who was contemplating suicide. I said, Pastor, I want to thank you that you took the time to talk to me when nobody else would. That you made me go talk to the doctor and get help. There was another note from a family. They were not members of the church. I'm not even sure how religious they were, but they lost their three-month-old baby. I did a funeral service for them. And a month later, they said, you know, Pastor, we're getting through because we're holding on to the words you shared with us. And there are dozens of those in that little baggie. And I said, I don't keep the ones that, oh, you know, greatest sermon in the world, Pastor, the greatest. I put those quickly end up in the files because I know how people's moods and attitudes can change. But the one that I keep encouraging because it tells me that I'm doing some things right sometimes. And your ministers need to hear that. Your ministers need to hear that a sermon did have an impact upon their life. That a conversation had an impact upon their life. Because sometimes we wonder, am I really making it? I have a friend who left the ministry. Why? Because he didn't think he had an impact upon and after he left the ministry, his people came and talked to me, and they said, why did he leave? We loved him. We loved his preaching. We loved his counseling. And I said, did you ever let him know that? And they didn't have a word. Notice what uh, Paul says first in Romans. He says this. He says, I long to see you, that may I impart to you some spiritual gift and make you strong. He says, I want to come among you, Romans, because I want to share with you of my ministry. But notice this. He says, that is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. We do what we do as pastors so that we can grow together. That we can become the people that God wants us to be together. None of us does it in isolation. You need your pastors, your pastors need you. And then Paul really drives it home in Galatians when he says this, Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Now Paul is not talking about you know, paying the pastor's salary. He's saying if the pastor has said something to you that encourages you, if the pastor has, has led you to, to a deeper understanding of God, share that with them. Share the joy. Share the triumph. Not to puff up your pastor's head, but to encourage them to say, you know what, I'm doing what God has called me to do. I mentioned last week that uh, Bernice Manning's daughter brought me all those sermon notes. And I'm reading through the sermon notes, and I'm looking at the notations that Bernice made upon them. Because she would go back during the week, and she told me this, I'd go back during the week and I would look at your notes again. And written in a different color ink was commentary upon things I had said. Oh, this was important. I need to work on this. Yeah, Pastor was right here. And reading those things again reminds me that almost 30 years of preaching God's Word had an impact at least on one little old lady in course of South Dakota. Encourage your pastors. Not with false praise and flattery, but if something has an impact, if something has a kingdom impact, let them know. 
because it's not going to go to their heads, it's going to go to their hearts. Pray for us, encourage us. Thirdly, be open to trying new things. It's amazing that churches kind of <laughs> like things the way things are. That they don't like change. And I know a lot of churches are afraid new pastor comes in, going to throw over everything, it's all going to be wholesale change, and we're not going to recognize anything in the worship or in the ministry. Well, that's not a very good ministry that comes in and turns everything upside down. Notice what Jesus says. He says, therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like an owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. You see, the smart minister embraces the history of the church, listens to the, the heart of the people, and if there's things that are blessing and working, you keep your hands off them. But if there is something that can move the church in a different direction. That can build upon what's already happened. You know, that, that, that a faithful minister wants to do that. So I know the tendency of people to kind of like things the way they are. I've been on the uh, receiving end of people who are not happy when I suggest, well, maybe we tweak this or maybe we. What's important is for God's people to, to work together, to move forward, to advance the kingdom. What worked a hundred years ago doesn't work today. I shared uh, with some of you uh, when I preached the uh, first pulpit exchange over at Harrison Christian Reformed Church. And I was going to, you know, be a good preacher. So I took all of my songs out of the Psalter hymnal <coughs> of the old browsing, you know, song this, song that, song that. And I thought I'd really, you know, was doing something good. Afterwards, the elder came up to me and he said, you know, Pat, that was really nice. He goes, we haven't sung out of the first part of the Psalter in about 15 years. <laughs> it was good, you know, we've been singing all that. And I thought, oh, man, you know, we don't do things the same. I don't remember praise choruses 25 years ago. I don't remember some of the things that, that, that are going on. I remember working uh, for a pastor that said, you know what, you wear a suit to tie in the office. You know, things change. And if you're listening to the word of God, you can move forward. And that's the key. You don't make change for change sake. You follow the lead of the Holy Spirit, but the pastor cannot be leading out front and there's nobody behind him. There has to be a willingness to say, okay, maybe let's try this. Now, when I was a pastor out in New Jersey, we had for a while a, a youth pastor. Great guy, young guy. I knew his father in seminary. And he came to me one day and he said, you know, I, I want to try something different, but I think that the kids and the parents may not get behind. I said, do you believe that it's going to be a blessing? Is it going to, something that's going to help him? Well, absolutely. I said, go try it. He said, you try it, I've got your back. It failed miserably. But he was willing to try, and I was willing to back him up. I'm going to come with some suggestions which may not have worked. And then I wrote the things that at first glance say, why in the world is he suggesting? But nine times out of ten, I usually have a reason. And if you want your pastor to get better, you got to let the pastor do things a little bit different. To try new things. Again, when I was first here, the first two years of ministry, I was a manuscript preacher. Some of you don't, probably don't remember that, but I would sit there, I'd be like this, and I'd be going, because that's how I was taught. Hopefully, people would read a lot easier when I just preach out of an outline. But you've got to be willing to change, to try some new things. Give the pastor, you know, a little rope. If he hangs himself, it's on you. But be open to try some new things. All right, moving on. The big P. you got to participate. 
The pastor may be leading, he may be one to try to do things, but if people don't step up, then the pastor's out there alone. The pastor cannot do ministry alone. We talked about this last week. The pastor's job is to help people become equipped for ministry. See, ministry belongs to the people. Ministry belongs to the church. The pastor is the one who equips. The pastor is the one who resources. The pastor is not the one who does it. The pastor is not the one who unlocks the door in the morning, who shovels the sidewalk when it snows, who makes sure the lights are turned off, who runs the bulletins, who, who does... And I, I know pastors like this. I know churches like this where the pastor is expected to do everything. And those pastors don't last very long because they burn out. See, the church is not a one-man operation. It is the body of Christ in a given location who is working together. And the pastor gets better as the people pray. As they step into leadership roles, as they volunteer for uh, opportunities for positions to lead or uh, or to serve, notice what what Peter says: each one, that means every one, should use whatever gift he has received, which means all of you have a gift. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand and say, "Do you know what your gift is?" We're not going to do that today. But every one of you has. Each one of you should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, church. Faithfully administering God's grace in all its various forms, which means your giftedness are very good. Things that you can do are different. You guys can do things that I cannot do. And the church needs all of you. I'll give you just one example. It's that time of the year again. It's nomination time. And I'm sitting with both churches talking about nominations. And I've done this for 30 years. I'll tell you how it goes. They get the list, they go, who's eligible? And they put a list together. And they look at the list and say, okay, well, they would be good, but they said no last time. That person would never serve, so we're not going to. I've seen this in every church I've worked at. The five interim churches I've worked at, I saw uh, it in New Jersey. I see it here. Well, they're not going to want to serve. And I said, have you ever asked them? Because I can remember lots of times when someone said, so and so will never serve on the consistent. I said, let me talk to them. Would you like to be on Kids History? I know you haven't served for a number of years. You know, Pastor, I was waiting for somebody to ask me. Well, the elders and deacons are going, hmm, we may have to revise that list we put together the other night. Because some of you may be giving a knock on your door or a phone call. Ask your can I serve the church in this way? Maybe you can, maybe you can't. But maybe you can serve the church in another way. Because there's always opportunities for service. And it may be up front. It may be in the back. It may be in the kitchen. It may be shovel in the snow. But there is a way that you can bless each other. Just got to participate. Okay, moving on. The next thing, and I will say this for every minister who has ever been a minister, one of the things that you can do to make us pastors better is to let us know. Is to let us know. Pastors are not mind readers. We don't know what's going on every day of every single moment. We don't know what's going on in people's hearts in the church. I'll give you an example of this. I am a uh, talking to someone after church one Sunday, pre-COVID. I said, I, I haven't seen you guys in a few weeks. Uh, what's up? Oh, you know, Pastor, I was in the hospital. And I said, no, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't tell you that I was in the hospital because I know how busy you are. I got this stupid look on my face. 
You didn't tell me you were in the hospital because I was busy doing what? I said, that's my business. That's what I do. Look at my call. My call is to, to preach the word and to visit the sick. I said, never assume that I am too busy because what is going on in your life is my business. It's my calling. Let us know. I would rather have a dozen people came up to me and say, you know, so-and-so is in the hospital. Or, you know, so-and-so has a need. I would rather hear it from everybody in the congregation than have nobody tell me. Never assume your pastor knows what's going on. Because that helps us to do our job better. It helps us to, you know, to meet people where they are. You know, this person was a week in the hospital, never got visited by anybody because they didn't know the Lord. We're made to be bothered. That's what pastor's calling is. In fact, the major part of a pastor's ministry is interruptions. If you look at the ministry of Jesus. Most of Jesus' ministry took place when someone interrupted him. Jesus is on the way somewhere. What happens? Son of David, have mercy on me, Bartimaeus cries. Jesus is on his way to the cross. And all of a sudden, there's a wee little man looking down from a sycamore tree, and Scripture says Jesus stopped. If you want to know an interesting Bible study, look at all the times that Jesus is interrupted, and he stops to do something. He's on his way to raise the daughter. <coughs> He's going to raise Jairus' daughter. What happens? Some woman with an issue of blood grabs a hold of his robe, and Jesus stops. Ministry is about interruptions. Let us know. Let me know. Call me. Send me a text. Put a smoke signal up. Just let me know. All right, here we go. The last thing that congregations need to do, if you want a better pastor, is to extend grace to them. To extend grace to them. I've been a minister for a very, very long time. And you would have thought that I would have covered every mistake that was possible for a minister to make. That's not true. I make new mistakes all the time. I'm very, very inventive on messing up. And if you thought you'd call the perfect pastor who will never say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing, hmm, sorry, you better check your receipt because that's not what you've done. But that's okay. You guys aren't perfect either. As a minister, we preach grace. But we also want to model it. We want to show, we want to extend the grace. Because we know that people in their brokenness, they do make mistakes. And it's easy to just shove people right out the door. But that's not being a good minister. But it's reciprocal. If you want your pastor to be a better pastor, then you're going to realize that they make mistakes and be willing to forgive. That's what Paul says again in Colossians 3.13. It says, make allowance. I love that. This, this isn't the NIV translation. This is another translation. But it says, make allowance for others' faults. Now, what does that mean? It means that you know that they're going to come. You know that someone's going to make a mistake. And you've already decided ahead of time you're going to extend grace. You're going to extend forgiveness. You know, that's how I plan on treating God's people. I hope that God's people will treat me and my family the same way. We all know the horror stories about PKs. Don't we? Now remember, my home church drove a pastor out because they couldn't believe that the pastor's kid could make a mistake. The pastor's kid could do something wrong. My kid and my wife are no more perfect than I am. They're no more perfect than you are. But let's not pretend. Let's model the grace of Jesus Christ to one another. That's how you do it. and you're open to to try things with them. You know, you participate.
anticipate you. Uh, you do all of these things. You, you let them know you extend grace. Well-known Christian leader was approached by some members of the uh, of local congregation. And they came to this pastor for advice. They said, you know, our minister's just not working out. Is there a way that we can get rid of our pastor? Now, this was a wise pastor, and he knew that they weren't exactly being fair to this other man. And so here's the advice that he gave for him. He says, here's, here's what you want to do. If you really want to get rid of your minister, here's what you need to do. First, look your pastor straight in the eye when he is preaching and surprise him by saying amen once in a while. If you do that, he'll preach himself to death. And you'll be rid of him. Pat him on the back. Tell him, you know, he did a good job. Then he'll work himself to death. And then you've gotten rid of him. Rededicate your life to Jesus Christ and ask your minister, Pastor, is there something that I can do for the church? He said, he'll probably drop dead right there. <laughs> but if you really want to get rid of your minister, he said, get the whole church to pray for him. Because soon he'll become so effective that a larger church will be dying to take him off. You have expectations of me. I have expectations of you. For the ministry here in Corsica to be successful, it's going to take both of us working together. In the give and take, in the rhythm I chose the hymn that we have in closing here just because it reminds us that we all, pastors and parishioners, are servants of the Lord. Let's share together in the service.
sharing of our offering. For it advances the kingdom not only in our community, but at the very ends of the earth. Let's pray. Father, you have blessed us. You have given us really more than we deserve. Even in moments when we think that we do not have enough, we are called to stewardship. We are called to share. Father, may we have generous hearts for one another and for the gospel. Receive the gifts that we will bring in Jesus' name. Amen. Now and forever.